Well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. The robotic cat. It's a long story. This is the Asus Z890 Pro Art. If you make money with your computer, Pro Art from Asus should be on your radar as something to look at because Asus is usually trying to do something different with their Pro Art line. It's a little beyond enthusiast but not quite workstation. This is the Pro Art motherboard with Thunderbolt 5, which is a large part of why I have it. 10 gigabit ethernet built in, plus two and a half gig, plus Wi-Fi 7, a 16 plus one, plus two, plus two power phase delivery. There's a lot to unpack, so let's unpack it. Ta-da! All right, what do you get in the box? Well, you get the motherboard, which we'll come back to in just a second. Look at that, it's a bag of holding. I can store Steve's dice in here or something. KVM won't fit in here. Store at level one text.com. We've also got a fancy Wi-Fi antenna, M.2 mounting accessories and some rubber spacers for the uh, M.2. A front panel breakout header. This is the easy connector. Basically, you can connect your front panel to this, which makes it a lot easier to get to, and then this will go to your front panel header. Because sometimes the wiring with the case is a little fiddly. Two six gigabit per second SATA ports, and lots and lots and lots of extra M.2 mounting accessories, including the quick release plastic. You want to see something unhinged? <laughs> it wasn't unhinged at all. In fact, it's a very nice hinge. Now this is a heat absorption on just one side of your M.2, but that's completely fine. There are little rubber standoffs that you can use with this, but look, you've got four M.2, four 80 millimeter M.2 right under there, two here, two here. Plus your Gen 5 M.2, which is also a quick release. And this one is double-sided thermally, so this would be good for that T705 double-sided Gen 5 M.2. Now let's talk PCIe slots and slot layout. You've got two X16 physical slots here that are X8, X8 to the CPU, and they are Gen 5. And then we've got one PCIe 4.0 by 16 slot at the bottom that's X4 electrical, and that's through the chipset. Officially, the motherboard supports four DIMMs, non-ECC, unbuffered, clocked, unbuffered DIMMs. No, so officially there's no ECC support. But in BIOS, as we'll see, there is actually an ECC option, and it will post and it seems to work with the uh, ECC DIMMs, ECC UDIMs that I have, but under Linux. At the rear I.O., we've got two 10 gigabit USB type A, a display port in, that is to make the graphics, like whatever GPU, add-in GPU that you have, work through the Thunderbolt 5 connections. Two Thunderbolt 5 connections, two 10 gigabit USB, HDMI, another Thunderbolt connection, but this is an older Thunderbolt. You've got a USB BIOS flashback, 10 gigabit, two and a half gig LAN, and two more 10 gig USB all the USB. You've also got Wi-Fi 7 with the fancy pants new quick release connectors, analog line out, analog microphone in, and your BIOS flashback button. At the bottom edge of the motherboard we've got a fair bit of other connectivity. Your front panel audio of course, an RS-232 serial port, two four pin fan headers, we've got two 50-50 RGB headers, these are the addressable RGB headers uh, that are there, clear CMOS button, a USB 2.0 header, a com debug header, three analog temperature sensors, a four pin fan header. There is a TPM module header, as well as your front panel connection. At the front edge of the motherboard, we've got four six gigabit SATA ports, that's two pair. A 20 pin USB five gigabit header, USB type C, 24 pin motherboard, and then another uh, addressable RGB header. The top edge of the motherboard, we've got three four pin fan headers, which have little rubber protector things on them, and then two eight pin connectors for CPU power. Now, even though this is a Z890 motherboard, and at the time that I'm making this video, the less expensive B860 chipset launched, there's still a lot of reasons to buy this motherboard, mainly if you need two slots that have PCIe Gen 5 connectivity, or onboard 10 gigabit, or you're just looking to a premium build. This motherboard pairs really well, I think, with the Core Ultra 9 or the Core Ultra 7. I wouldn't use a less expensive CPU with this motherboard because, unless you have like very, very specific needs, because the connectivity here, PCIe 5, Gen 5, 10 gigabit Ethernet, you're going to need a fast CPU with a lot of cores to keep up with it. And the K-series CPUs are overclockable, and this motherboard can overclock, and at least in terms of power delivery, and the, the VRM is definitely overbuilt, and that is a substantial heatsink on this platform. So let's get a test bench put together and see where we go. 
For memory, I'm going to be using DDR5-8200. The thing that's surprising about the DDR5-8200 is that these CU DIMMs have actually worked really well on even less expensive B860 motherboards. And that was one of the differentiating factors of like less expensive motherboards is that it was a little bit problematic to get DDR5, you know, above 7200 working unless you had, you know, more than an eight layer PCB and that the, 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 the DDR5 design was very thoughtful and blah, blah, blah. CU DIMMs, they don't care. You can easily get over 100 gigabytes per second throughput, which is Intel's platform's claim to fame right now. The multi-core performance is, is quite good on the new CPUs, even though the gaming performance is not quite where anybody, even Intel, expected it to be. But because we're doing this at the beginning of 2025, these motherboards have had a lot of uh, firmware and microcode and BIOS updates since launch. And so the performance of these motherboards is actually uh, a little bit higher than it was when CPUs launched. And actually it's kind of funny because with Windows and everything else, uh, the competing platform from AMD is also a little bit faster because the CPU architecture, like in terms of having tiles, multiple pieces of silicon, the latency and interface penalties that come with that. A lot of similar design philosophy here that's, uh, well, I mean, it's different, it's similar, but different, but very different. But a lot of the changes that were made to the operating system to benefit this new philosophy, benefit both kinds of CPUs a lot. So, interesting. But anyway, let's get this put together. Now, ASUS, if you're not aware, has their whole PC DIY community segment thing. You should check that out. And there's lots of little hidden PC DIY features on boards like the ProArt that are, you know, sort of aimed at somebody that's DIY that maybe is not rebuilding their computer every year. So to that end, I have not connected my CPU 8-pin power. Look, there's a red LED on the motherboard saying, hey, you gotta connect at least one of these. As part of the PC DIY, ASUS has colored LEDs at the top front edge of the motherboard, and that'll help you figure out what's wrong with the system if it won't post. The green LED is on, let us know that you should be seeing output. If you're not, double check your monitor connections, make sure that you've got your monitor plugged in the right thing and the right input on your monitor but it'll show you if it's having CPU problems or if you forgot that CPU power cable or if maybe the memory isn't seated correctly. There's a different LED for the memory. If it's taking a long time to do memory training, there's an LED for that because DDR5 memory can take five, 10 minutes to train. CU DIMMs generally take a little less time. That's what I've got it in here. The Kingston Fury CU DIMMs 8200, very fast, very stable and uh, a lot of fun getting it to run at 8200 because you're over 100 gigabytes per second memory transfer and on this motherboard that was pretty easy to do. I've cleared the CMOS because this is what it looks like to flash the BIOS. Now this motherboard has something that no other motherboard has and at the time that I'm shooting this I've only got to play with this feature for two days and that is 256 gigabytes of memory. Sort of specifically this is the first motherboard to support that but not just to support well support so you gotta understand some stuff about DDR5 that I'll talk about in a second, but 256 gigabytes of memory actually works reasonably okay on this motherboard. DDR5 5600 across all four DIMMs and pushing past that to like 6000 and beyond was also doable, which I'm shocked. Kingston is the kit that gets that done and Kingston and Asus have apparently worked together. It's AEMP3 and so, or AE. M3, it's a different, like there's XMP and there's Expo for AMD and this is something else. Kingston and, and Asus have worked together, like come together to give us 256 gigabytes of memory because they want to do that. And right now this is kind of an Asus exclusive feature. Now I expect competitors to pick this up really quickly because hey, Kingston wants to sell more memory. But the dirty little secret that I was alluding to with DDR5 is that historically on any platform since DDR5 launched, two DIMMs generally would perform much, much worse than one DIMM per channel. So you would only use two sticks of memory, and that's what I've recommended since time immemorial. It's like, oh, DDR5 6000, two sticks of memory. If you're gonna run CU DIMMs at 8200, two sticks of memory. But this is the first motherboard BIOS platform combination on the Core Ultra 285K, where you can run four DIMMs and there's not a tremendous speed penalty. Like, Intel's official support is like 4400, which I think is, uh, not reasonable if you're going to run a four DIMM configuration. So if you need 256 gigabytes of memory and the CPU horsepower of a you know 24 
core, I mean, you get mixed E cores and P cores, so cores, uh, will get it done, then you can do 256 gigabytes of memory on this platform at a reasonable speed now. I think 5600 just barely squeaks over the reasonable speed line, especially when you can do DDR5 8200. But with an overclock, I actually found that it was more stable. Even given that this platform supports 256 gigabytes of memory, I'm also curious how much the performance has improved since the launch of the Z890 platform. Like I said, this BIOS is only two days old at the beginning of January when I'm shooting this video. It came out January 10th. There's a lot of changes under the hood and the management engine. The BIOS option to warn you that, hey, the management engine is out of date. The management engine is a part of a, the low level ecosystem for things that the operating system normally doesn't have to worry about, but in this case works in concert with how the CPU is doing scheduling, how the CPU is telling the VRM, hey, I'm gonna need a bunch of power in a second or not in order to, for boost voltages to happen and so the boost clocks can happen and everything else performance. So I'm doing Cinebench single thread, multi-thread, just to get a look to see how much, if anything, has improved. I mean, it's improved a little bit, but how, how much has it improved? On the most up-to-date BIOS with the support for the 256 gigabyte Kingston kit, that's four DIMMs, um, there's no options that I can find that are exposed now that say anything about ECC. Booting Linux with ECC UDIMMs works, but there's no EDAC driver. So I'm not sure if this is a platform enablement thing or what's going on. I don't think that ECC is actually working. Maybe you're getting transparent single bit correction, but uh, I think we might have to wait for the W880 chipset. Possibly, that's disappointing because this motherboard otherwise ticks literally all of the boxes. Although you can't get a 256 gig ECC UDIM kit. So, eh, it's probably fine. And if you're wondering about PCIe bifurcation, there is an option and you can configure that X16 slot basically any which way you want, but they don't label it in the direct way with the lanes. It basically is labeled how you would be using it. So like a GPU, which is X8 with two M.2 slots, as we saw for like the Intel Arc B580, that's an eight lane card and there are certain AIB makers that are still giving you a 16 lane card using it in an X8, X4, X4 configuration with two M.2 on your GPU, which is fine. That's a perfectly reasonable way to do that. Well, you can enable that in the BIOS. There's a BIOS option for that. For overclocking and calibrating your cooler and figuring out whatever you wanna do, this has basically the same level of options that you would get from like a Hero, like the Asus Hero motherboard, in terms of voltage control, dim voltage control, uh, overriding the ring, you can even override the microcode. There's an option that will allow you to load old microcode directly from the menu. But I've got my management engine updated and everything else. I don't want to load old microcode because the old microcode is worse than the new microcode in terms of raw performance. Now, in terms of raw performance for single thread and everything like that, uh, I was like maybe 6% faster overall. The launch performance for gaming versus today is like 5 6% faster. And that's owing to operating system updates as well as the updates that Intel has done. That is not just purely an Intel update. And because it's operating system updates, those operating system updates also benefit Intel's competitor as well. So, yeah, maybe something we'll revisit in another video. That said, I am super jazzed. This is the first motherboard on planet Earth to offer a reasonable 256 gig experience. Desktop motherboard, to be sure. I'm not talking about servers. Servers, 256 gig is old hat. That's like six, seven generations old. But 256 gigabytes on a desktop platform for the people that need 256 gigabytes is going to be a welcome thingy. And if you're one of those people that's like, yes, I've been waiting forever for 256 gigabytes, you should chime in below because literally nobody in this space believes that this is a thing. They treat me like a weirdo because it's like, hey, I would love to have some like DDR5 6000 and beyond 256 gigabytes. Can we go with a triple channel platform? Would it be so crazy to just, I need, I need more memory bandwidth to feed those beastly cores, you know, eight, 16, 24 cores, more P cores. I just, I need the performance. This has been a quick look at the ASUS ProArt Z890 Creator Wi-Fi. It ticks all the boxes. It's pricey, it's a premium board, but you get kind of a lot of features for that price. And hey, first board, reasonable 256 gigabytes of memory support thanks to Kingston and uh, ASUS coming together. More on that later, probably, I don't know. Let's hang out in the forums at level one. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.